Hi, this is Dr. Diane Gayhart, and this is my lecture on evidence-based treatments in child, couple, and family therapy. This lecture is designed to accompany my uh, textbook series with Cengage that includes Mastering Competencies in Family Therapy, Theory and Treatment and Planning in Family Therapy, Theory and Treatment Planning and Counseling and Psychotherapy, and Case Documentation. So before we even get into all the details, um, I think it's real important to talk about what is an evidence-based treatment. This word gets used a lot in the field. Um, and, and the field is very rapidly moving towards um, uh, being evidence-based, the field of mental health. And, and if you're working in any type of um, community or government-funded um, agency, you'll probably be talking a lot about EBTs. Um, and so I want to make sure, though, we're clear on all the different terms, because there are um, a lot of different uh, forms of research, and some of the, I go into more detail in some of my uh, texts on this. So what most people are talking about, especially in government-funded agencies, is an evidence-based treatment, um, which is called by SAMHSA um, evidence-based practices. Uh, SAMHSA is a Substance Abuse and Mental Health um, Administration for the U.S. government. So they use this t uh, term, EBTs, to primarily refer to a manualized treatment, and in our case it's mental health treatment, that targets a very specific population and or presenting problems, such as um, adolescents with conduct disorder. There are even EBTs, you know, for African-American adolescents with conduct disorder. So it can be very specific. Um, and the EBT, to be considered an EBT, in clinical trials, there need to be clinical trials that shows that the treatment is effective for this population. And they're actually you know, various levels in terms of how effective they are. Are they just effective compared to controls or compared to treatment as usual or compared to another um, direct competition? But just to be considered an EBT, you just have to be more effective than a waitlist control. So, and this is different though from, I'm glad you're sitting down, evidence-based practice. So really focus on the, um, the plural here because evidence-based practices is how SAMHSA frequently re refers to um, what researchers tend to call EBTs, um, but evidence-based evidence practice in the singular form is a more general term, and it refers to um, you know both uh, medical as well as mental health professionals um, that are providing services, developing treatment plans, using available evidence. And so I would say in the 21st century, at least if you're using a third party payer like an insurance company, they would insist that everyone should be evidence, doing some form of evidence based practice in the field. And this has not been a habit in mental health the way it's been a habit in medical uh, and more traditional medical, physical medicine uh, side of the, uh, the healthcare world. And so for mental health clinicians, some of us are you know, learning this vocabulary and and, um, but learning about the research and the evidence for whatever treatment you're providing to whatever group you're providing it to in whatever context you're providing it is more and more, it is considered standard practice. And so that is what evidence-based practice in the singular refers to. And then you have evidence-informed practice. And this can, um, this is another uh, term that you will hear and often this is referring to um, your practice is based on research. It may or may not be clinical trial research. It may be even feedback from your clients, um, using measures from your clients. So evidence-informed practice, again, is similar to evidence-based practice, but again, it's, it's a more general term and that you're using some kind of research to inform your clinical decisions. And usually when you see the term evidence-informed practice, um, they're doing it more on a case-by-case -case basis. So what are we going to talk about in um, this lecture? Um, we're going to look at the uh, couple and family evidence base, uh, which also includes many of the childhood disorders. Um, and these, these approaches actually have a very, um, they're all systemically um, grounded, uh, the basic um, EBTs we'll be looking at. Um, and they have a very, actually, uh, strong and well-established um, evidence base for many specific disorders. And the couple and family uh, evidence-based treatments are indicated 
frequently when you're working with a child, obviously a couple or a family, but also with children. Um, and also if you're working with an adult who has uh, multiple problems or chronic problems and or complex presenting problems, difficult to treat problems, the more difficult um, it is to treat a disorder, the more likely you're going to need couple or family therapy as part of stabilizing not just the individual, but the social context and the relationships. So we're going to start by talking about childhood disorders. So um, we're going to begin by talking about child and adolescent behavioral disorders. So there is a lot of research that family interventions with children who have behavioral issues um, has a sig uh, significant impact. Um, and that these uh, interventions increase both the children's pro-social behaviors as well as reducing antisocial behaviors. And so parent training programs, which are actually very cost effective, um, have very, you know, long-term uh, sustained gains, 70% of children maintaining their gains after one year after follow-up. So that's really positive and it um, has very long-term effects, especially when working with younger kids. And these parenting uh, interventions, family interventions for behavioral issues, uh, they are effective for preschoolers all the way up through high school with a range of ethnicities. So it is a very well-established intervention for working with kids with behavioral um, issues. In terms of uh, more difficult uh, adolescent behavioral disorders, specifically conduct or oppositional defiant, um, there is actually a very well established um, evidence base for this in large measure because uh, the U.S. government has put a lot of money into preventing conduct disorder because it is so costly for society. And so there are four uh, well established um, uh, evidence-based treatments including multisystemic, functional family therapy, multidimensional family therapy, and brief strategic family therapy. And all of these are very family focused. Um, it is family therapy the whole way through, unlike the parenting for behavioral disorders, often just a group sitting setting. These are all done in, um, with the entire family present. Um, and it uses a lot of the basic structural and strategic elements uh, as well as looking at the broader social context or some of the commonalities in these um, four very well-established um, treatments for conduct disorder, which historically has been a very difficult to treat um, condition. And it is very exciting that we have so many um, evidence-based treatments uh, in this area. You'll also find that these treatments for a conduct disorder are the same treatments that are typically used uh, in adolescent substance abuse, the same EBTs for adolescent substance abuse. Um, and yes, those two things often go hand in hand. So now let's look at it, um, attention deficit disorder and autism. So for ADD, ADHD, um, parent training is definitely considered an important part of treatment in any, in, in, in any evidence-based approach. You know, there can be uh, medications added or not, but parent training is considered essential to um, an evidence-based approach to treating ADHD. And so there are um, several programs, including the parent-child interaction therapy, and where often you're working with the parent-child dyad. There's the Triple P positive parenting program, as well as the incredible years, the last two being more group interventions. And both actually do address hyperactivity and inattention. And so um, adding that parenting piece is really essential um, when working with ADD, ADHD. In terms of autism, there are um, fewer studies, but increasingly um, there is more attention given to the uh, family and family um, context. So what they did find in one with preschool autism um, communication trial that was run, that there were um, positive outcomes, more child interact, uh, initiations with the parents, so the kids initiating contact or interaction. There was more positive um, parental synchronous responses from the child, so the kids responding better and initiating better. And um, there was just greater parent-child shared attention. So this is uh, an area where there's more attention going to it in recent years. Childhood mood disorders are also uh, quite common. In terms of depression, there's actually only one evidence-based treatment that's been developed for um, younger kids, school-aged children, um, four to sixth grade, and that's called stress busters. And it is 
a program that involves both the parents and the children. Um, interestingly, in terms of adolescence, uh, family involvement is more effective. So having the family involved, doing family therapy for uh, addressed, depressed teens is more effective. And in my clinical experience, it's not the most common. Um, so that's, I think, an important uh, finding. Another is that involving families has, has longer lasting results, which makes a lot of sense. And a particular approach that has been um, used uh, is attachment-based family therapy in terms of working with adolescents um, who are depressed. Now, in terms of bipolar and depression, um, multifamily psychoeducational groups um, have been identified both for, we're going to talk about schizophrenia, but also for bipolar and depression as having, um, a very, you know, improving outcomes with more positive emotions and fam more positive family interactions, as well as um, the family becoming and the, and the client becoming more involved and invested in treatment. And then additionally, um, a child and family focused CBT, so that's one approach there with, that has both the child and family uh, pieces, um, improves both the symptoms and overall functioning um, with bipolar and depression, as well as lower dropout. And that was a specific evidence-based treatment that was used. So you're just gonna see a theme here with childhood disorders. <clears throat> so here now we're looking at childhood anxiety, eating and trauma disorders. So no surprise here that there are better outcomes using family-based than individual-based CBT when working with anxiety disorders. And again, um, you're affecting not just the individual, but the individual's context, and then also having the parents learn how to interact. Um, it, it really does help children. And this includes, um, you know, social anxiety, generalized anxiety, social phobia, OCD, all of that. Um, better outcomes always with family. I think that's one of the take homes from this um, segment here. A really interesting, um, I, I think, study was that family-based eight-week group um, that was designed to um, prevent the development of anxiety in children significantly actually reduce future anxiety. 31% um, of uh, the control group developed anxiety compared to only 5% of this uh, treatment group of this eight week. Um, and that's also, man, it, when I, you think about that, you're like, wow, uh, that is exciting. And hopefully in the years ahead, there will be a lot more programs like this that really prevent anxiety, preventing depression. We know enough to do that. And it's really exciting to see that they're doing research and it makes a huge difference. And so hopefully in the future, like I said, um, we can be part of shifting things in that way. In terms of childhood eating disorders, um, and, and so here you're thinking um, even, you know, kids and teens who are living at home with their families, there's a very strong evidence base for family-based approaches. In fact, many of the systemic and structural family therapists began working with eating disorders with families. And there are always stories about Mnuchin, um, you know, ha actually having the meal hosted, you know, in session. And certainly the Milan team, uh, much of their research focused on this. And uh, currently there is the Maudsley method is probably the most well-known evidence-based treatment for eating dis childhood eating disorders. And these are different than adults. Um, and again, it's using strict, strategic and structural elements as part of the process, which is no surprise since so much of the early research um, was uh, around eating disorders and family therapy. In terms of child abuse and neglect uh, and other forms of trauma, there's a lot of using parent interaction therapy, um, multi-systemic family therapy, which we heard about uh, regarding adolescent conduct, and then also trauma-focused CBT, which uh, is widely implemented uh, where I live here in Los Angeles area. It is both an individual and family-based approach, uh, 12 to 16 week method for working with children who've experienced trauma. And it's an evidence-based treatment um, that I think that's fairly widely used. And it does have both the individual and family elements, which again is so important. Now, this one actually surprised me when I first heard about this research which was probably almost two decades ago now that I say that, um, it makes you begin to feel a little old, but uh, childhood physical disorders, that doing family therapy um, for certain child physical disorders um, is, is considered an evidence-based treatment, um, probably not surprisingly, in and capricious 
with fairly high success rates. Um, but also for recurrent abdominal pain, using behavioral family therapy for those you know kids who have a lot of pain usually can't go to school. It's normally where the issue um, becomes apparent, but also for asthma and diabetes. Doing um, family therapy can help the physical symptoms in these disorders. So we're gonna move on to talking about adult disorders. And I will let you know too, I put uh, psychosis, schizophrenia in the adult disorder section just because normally you see it in late adolescence or mid-late adolescence and so I just put it in this section. So adult depression is probably one of the most important areas to understand the evidence base. And there's been some really interesting uh, research actually around adult depression, one of the most common mental health disorders, I think health conditions actually, at least in the United States. Um, so one, one, one thing, I guess we can start from the top here, that couples therapy is equally effective to individual treatment for depression, and that couples therapy is more um, effective if the individual is having um, relational distress. And what they've actually found is about 30% of adults who become depressed are depressed primarily because of their relationship issues, one sort of another, their intimate partner, child, parent. Um, and so when depression um, begins, even just because of a relational distress, primarily couple distress, couples therapy is the appropriate treatment. And, and using individual and or um, psychotropic medication is not as effective. And even if you do successfully treat the quote unquote depression, uh, the depressive symptoms with medications and or individual therapy, um, the person's at high risk for relapse because the problem has not been solved. And so I think one of the most important whether messages in this video here, whether you're a family therapist, psychologist, you know, professional counselor, social worker, um, is that adult depression, you really need to screen whether or not uh, it began because of relational issues. And if it does, did, couples therapy is really the correct treatment and the only treatment that's going to probably have long-lasting effects. And that's so why I think that's real important. It's, it's such a common presenting problem and it's important for people to really think uh, more sophisticated. I think, you know, research is forcing us to uh, ask more um, sophisticated questions, do more sophisticated assessments so that we can identify the correct treatment. Um, another issue uh, or area of research around adult um, alcohol and substance use. And again, what's, I don't know if it's surprising or not, um, it's not always, I think, how treatment's done, but the treatment of choice for alcohol and substance use in adults in all phases, getting someone to enter treatment, actively, uh, the active treatment phase and the uh, maintaining sobriety phase um, is, is couples or family-based therapy. And a large part of that is because a lot of the substance use is, you know, reinforced in one way or another or built into family dynamics. And if we all know, if you've been in the field long enough, that if you don't change the uh, relational or family or, you know, um, broader social context dynamics, that it's much more, much harder to actually have long-term success with alcohol or substance use issues. So in behavioral couples therapy, it's a specific evidence-based treatment um, that is used during the active phase uh, in treating adult um, alcohol and substance use. So I want to talk a little bit about OCD, PTSD, and psychosis. So OCD often um, we think of that treating that with individual CBT, um, but partner-assisted CBT for um, diagnoses like agoraphobia, that the individual treatment um, is also, the individual's also symptoms improve, but the relational distress also gets improved. And when you think of a uh, diagnosis like OCD, it definitely affects the people in the household. Um, and so having that relational distress uh, go down, any um, tension between the couple, again, is gonna prevent, help prevent relapse. In terms of PTSD, when you think of uh, treating either adults with childhood abuse, uh, such as sexual abuse, or adults who've experienced trauma through military or other forms of um, you know, trauma, PTSD is very effective. And if you think of these sorts of living with someone and your partner has you know, PTSD, that this, this definitely affect, affects the entire um, the relationship significantly. 
And so PT, uh, EFT, Emotionally Focused cu uh, Couples Therapy, and or Family Therapy, and uh, Couple Focused CBTs have been used to successfully treat post-traumatic stress. In terms of severe mental illness, including psychosis and bipolar, um, there is significant research um, in the multifamily psychoeducational groups uh, reduce the rate of relapse at least 50 to 60 percent. And this is internationally. This, these programs uh, are effective uh, across the globe. Um, the research really does span every single continent. Um, and so although there's phenomenal research, it is one of the least implemented um, EBTs out there. Which is sad because it, you know, it's it does target severe mental illness, which is obviously difficult to treat, and these groups have been very effective. In fact, the group format, um, in most cases, is more effective than delivering the same psychoeducation individually to families because there is that sense of community um, that comes with the group, which is very significant because most people feel very ostracized, um, you know, when you're dealing with severe mental illness. Uh, another really interesting area, though, here is also the open dialogue approach in Finland. And Jaakko Sekula and his um, colleagues have developed over the last about probably three decades now this approach. It's the only one of the only uh, I think it's one of the only EBTs in here that I'm talking about that's really based on postmodern therapies, based on the work of Carl uh, Carl Tom uh, Tom Anderson, Arlene Anderson, um, and the f research from Finland is phenomenal. They've actually, 81% of first episode psych, um, clients with first episode psychosis have no residual psychotic symptoms two years later. They're working, they're functional, um, and, but they have, they have a very, um, the open dialogue part is, you know, immediate response team is in the living room within 24 hours if someone's reporting psycho psychotic symptoms and they have open dialogue, a kind of reflecting team style, where even the clients are listening to what the professionals are thinking. And it is a, um, an amazingly effective approach, which is, uh, we are trying to implement that here in the United States too, through Mary Olson, I believe in the Boston area. So in terms of couple distress, uh, yes, couples therapy is helpful for couple distress. And it is, uh, the research shows that this is real important. When couples are distressed, it's highly correlated with depression, anxiety, and substance use, um, with the highest correlations actually in bipolar, substance abuse, and generalized anxiety. There are two evidence-based treatments um, for couple distress. One is emotionally focused couples therapy, and the other is integrated uh, behavioral couples therapy. And both are very effective, usually 70% of couples uh, significantly improve, um, usually within 12 to 20 sessions. And couples in therapy far, fare better than 80% of the waitlist controls. Some researchers have said you hardly need a waitlist control with couples therapy because almost all couples get worse without it. So uh, couples therapy is very effective, especially the evidence-based approaches, both of which um, you can uh, learn uh, through relatively easy uh, and accessible means compared to some of maybe the other evidence-based treatments. I'm thinking specifically of like multi-systemic family therapy is usually uh, more done through large agencies than individual practitioners. In terms of domestic violence and intimate partner violence, um, they estimate that 25% of couples have some form of physical violence in a 10-year period. And the traditional gender-only treatment, where you put men in a group and women in a group, um, only 5% of the men actually improve, which is pretty low. And we still keep trying to do it anyway. So because the um, outcomes have been so poor in this area, there, there have been researchers, uh, such as Sandra Stith, um, who have begun looking at couples' treatment of certain forms, not all forms, certain forms of domestic violence, intimate partner violence. And they look at what's called a situational batterer. Is a batterer. It's a lower, usually lower level of violence and violent only within the relationship. And that accounts for about 65% of men. And this is the less severe form. This is not antisocial personality um, type. And someone who wants to stop is trying to stop that sort of thing. But they have found that um, multi-couple group therapy for this type of batterer, the situation only um, batterer, that is significantly more effective and actually they have found that the group format is more effective than delivering the same 
program individually and um, in large measures because they believe that the batterers are watching other batterers interact with their partners and that's when they begin to see what's going on. Very interesting and exciting research and again this is increasingly implemented even though it goes against all the norms from the last um, you know 10-20 years. Uh, you never uh, used to put couples who had had violence together in a room but under certain circumstances, you know, with this evidence-based manualized approach, uh, they are getting better outcomes. And so again, I highly recommend you get training before you try to implement that. And I think it's worth noting that relationship enhancement groups, um, these are groups, you know, like uh, before you get married, you know, you go to work on your relationship or communication. Um, often these are offered through religious organizations, but these actually really are helpful and there are significant improvements. And this is particularly impressive because these are not clinically distressed couples. These are usually couples who are happy and just want to make their relationship better. And it's even measurably makes their, increases their relationship satisfaction and prevents divorce. So those are worth knowing about too. And again, um, similar to the childhood disorders, adult physical health um, can also be improved with couple and or family therapy. And we're looking here, you can see the list, stroke, traumatic brain injury, spinal cord, cardiovascular, cancer, dementia, and diabetes. And for all of these, having some amount of couple and or family therapy can actually help the physical um, health outcomes. And I just wanna wrap it up with a couple of uh, reflections on the big take home message here for children and adolescents, family involvement in treatment is almost always appropriate and almost always um, treatment of choice. And for adults, a good guideline is the more severe, the more couple family um, treatments are appropriate, more severe, the more chronic. If there are multiple problems, involving more people helps. And then finally, with couple distress, it always warrants couples therapy. And it's you know very difficult to make those uh, changes when it's just one person. And just because someone's depressed, it doesn't mean individual therapy or even antidepressants are the answer, especially if couples distress is what started the depression. Well, I hope this was a uh, useful uh, overview of the evidence-based treatments for couple, uh, family, and child therapy.